So we're going to be in the book of Micah, Micah chapter 4. Um, a few weeks ago, I opened us up preaching through the first two chapters of Micah. Uh, last week, James uh, preached in Micah 3, and so now we'll be doing Micah 4. Today, we're going to be talking about our future hope. When we left off last week with James, um, you might have left here feeling a little sad, a little depressed, because the the sermon was all about bad leaders, and it kind of just left us there. You know, it was it was like if you watched Avengers Infinity War and never watched Endgame. And so this is the point where I'm allowed to spoil it. James said it was okay, like spoilers allowed. I'm just kidding. I saw this youth pastor spoil Avengers Endgame. Did you see it? It was like a video. Spoiled Endgame like a few days later. And I thought, first of all, I thought, I think biblical stoning's coming back. The sound out of the audience was like, boo. Um, but then also I was like, guys, calm down. It's still just uh, a movie with uh, a silly little movie. But Infinity War for sure is on Netflix and has been out for more than a year. Like, we can spoil that. That's tough. Um, but at the end of Infinity War, remember, like, it's sad. I don't know if you've seen it, but, like, it's sad. A lot of the good guys... It's inevitable. Dead, right. Turned to dust, actually. Um, it's very sad. So you walk out of there. We watched... James and I, we watched it. Um, ben was with us. Dave was with us, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a depressing night, right? And I feel like that's how we left last week because we were just like... This is how bad sin is, and this is how bad leaders are, and this is what it looks like in a corrupt society. Go well, in peace. <laughs> and so finally, we get to the next part this week, where there's actually a positive promise. Last week, we saw that broken people and broken systems make broken choices, and the result is chaos, and it is pain, and people are hurt, but the story doesn't stop there. So here we see, in Micah 4, a promise for what God is going to do in the last days. So, uh... Read with me in Micah 4, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways. And that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit. Every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted, and the lame I will make the remnant, and those who were cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? That pain seized you like a woman in labor? Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, Let her be defiled, and let our eyes gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hoofs bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples, and shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. So what we're going to be talking about tonight 
is this promise that kind of uses odd language to us, but is very powerful biblical language that I'm hoping that you'll, you'll catch as we walk through it of God's promise to uh, restore us, that we can walk seeing with what I would call eyes of hope, seeing differently amidst the, the sin that we have around us. So the main point is this, that we can live with humble confidence that God is going to punish sin and rescue his people. So the first thing that we're going to notice is what it looks like to live in light of the last days. It opens up with this uh, this phrase, in the latter days or in the last days, and we see it later on in verse 6. It says, in that day, and if you read the New Testament, you'll see this uh, phrase happen over and over again where it talks about in the last day or in the last days or in the future days or at the end, right? So we have a whole branch of theology that is built around this term, uh, the last days. It's a fun little word you can use at your next, um, I was going to say cocktail party, but since we're Baptist, I guess it's like grape juice party or something. Um, like mocktail party, that's what it was. Um, it, it's called eschatology, right? Fancy, right? I'll take eschatology for 800, Alex. Uh, it just means the study of uh, last things. Eschaton means the last uh, thing or uh, the, the end, the, the last. And so the question I think that we all have to ask is when all of this is over, what happens? Right? When, when your life is done and when this country is done and when this civilization is done and when God comes back, what happens? Now, that's not something that we think about a lot because uh, we have, uh, we try so much to avoid thinking about future things, right? We have been taught, uh, we've surrounded ourselves with stuff and comforts and busyness so that we can avoid thinking about anything in the future. We don't, who wants to sit around thinking about, well, I wonder what happens when I die? No one wants to think about death, which is why it surprises so many of us when it happens. Uh, no one wants to think about, well, what happens when uh, I'm gone and my kids are gone and my kids' kids are gone, right? No, no one thinks about that because we have built this cocoon of um, ignorance, really, where we do everything to distract ourselves from thinking about anything beyond ourselves. Uh, we want comfort. Uh, we, we look at our technology and we think we've sort of insulated ourselves from the end, but the reality is this, the end is coming. It will come for every person. There is an end to uh, all things, to all created things that's determined by God. And so we have to ask this question, what happens in the future? Is what we see now all there is, or is there more? And I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Now we don't, our eyes don't light up when we sing songs about the future, like those who live in places of uh, trouble, right? So when I go to third world, a third world country on a mission trip, <laughs> Uh, they're not, the, the, the verses of the hymns that their eyes light up on are songs about uh, heaven, are songs about Jesus returning, right? We're all about like the emotional stuff that makes us feel better, right? We're like anything that like, you know, uh, just gives me a little comfort for the moment, but they're like, the moment's kind of over, like it's bad. Like, I'm not sure where I'm going to eat tomorrow. I'm living off a dollar to a day. They're like, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when God comes back to make all this wrong right. And we could learn something from our brothers and sisters in places like this. That all of this progress that we've surrounded ourselves with will not and does not stop the ultimate question of what happens in the end. And so all through the Hebrew Bible, there's this picture of the future, really from Genesis 3, when sin enters the world, when the fall happens, all the way to the end of the Bible, the question is, what is God going to do to fix all of this? When's all the wrong going to be made right? When are all the lies going to be um, f turned around? When, are, when is truth going to come? When is evil going to be dealt with? When are we going to be saved? So one theologian describes the end of the Bible uh, in the book of Revelation, the very last book of, of Scripture. He says this, The vision of the future looked to a time when the kingship of God's people would be restored. In Jerusalem, and the Messiah would reign over that kingdom and rule all the nations in the world. In other words, it looks to a time that look, fits remarkably well with John's vision of the reign of Christ at the end of the Bible in Revelation 20. 
Historically, it's hard to understand Israel's prophets, which Micah is one, any other way than that they longed for the reestablishment of the kingship of, of God among his people. The fact that these books, such as Micah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and on and on, continued as scripture long after the exile was over shows that their reference looked far beyond any temporary fulfillment within Israel's own history. If our goal is to describe these prophetic visions and what they were referring to, we would have to understand them. We would, we would have to understand them as a hope for the future. And, the, and it fits best in this picture of Jesus Christ coming back to reign among his people. I read this quote, Things won't always be like this. You won't have it sad and gloomy always. Someday you will cry no more. And it reminds me of that passage, which I'll read later in Revelation 21, where it says that in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no more tears and no more crying, right? Isn't that what we long for? Right? I don't know if you, if you guys have had a week like that or a day like that or a month like that or maybe a year like that. For me, it's been about like nine months. Um, where you're just like, things are really broken. Right? Good is not rewarded. Wicked seems to be rewarded. Right? Sacrifice doesn't seem to be rewarded. Selfishness seems to be rewarded. You know, I don't know which political party you are because both of them seem to be at odds with what we see as the just will of God. Right? And so as Christians, we walk into this like the people of God in Micah 4 going like, it's, it's messed up, God. How long? When are you going to fix this? And we see the first down payment of that fix in Jesus. Uh, so I mentioned that the study of last things is called eschatology. Well, there's this term within eschatology that describes where we fit into this whole plan of God. And they call it inaugurated eschatology. I know, you guys are going to be like just killing it at your next board game night. I don't normally like to throw around these theological terms like that because the words aren't necessarily important, but I think these concepts are super helpful. Inaugurated eschatology is this idea, that the last things, the future of God, has been inaugurated, it started, but we're still waiting for its completion. Right. So when Jesus came and died on the cross... He brought the kingdom of God. So he says the kingdom of God is near. But we still await the full rule and reign of God when he comes back uh, at the second coming. And so in Acts 2, we see that the last days have begun. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. The kingdom is here, right? And Hebrews 1, 1, we see that God is speaking in these last days. So people are like, uh, are the last days here? Like, yes, they, they are, and they have been for 2,000 years, and we're still waiting for them to be uh, fulfilled. We're still waiting, like in James 5 or 2 Peter 3, for this final culmination. So the best illustration that I've heard, and I use it all the time because I think it is the best, is from a theologian named Oscar Kuhlmann, and he was he's a little bit older than me, a lot bit older than me, but he uses the description of World War II between uh, D-Day and Victory Day, right? So um, if you know anything about World War II... Uh, once the Allies established a beachhead in France at D-Day, uh, it was virtually certain that they were going to win the war. Because now you have uh, really a three-front war. You know, you have an Italian campaign, you have the Russians coming in, and now you have uh, the Western Front moving in. So, so the Axis powers coming towards, you know, uh, Germany, or they're, they're closing in from all the sides. It was, it was essentially over at that point. There's nowhere to run. You're going to lose. But it still took many, many months and many battles before the war was officially over. So the, so the distance between D-Day and Victory in Europe Day, V-E Day, was still some time. That's like us. Jesus came on the cross. We know the battle, the war has won. Well, we know who, who gets the ultimate victory, but there's still many battles to, to fight. And there's still much loss and suffering along the way as we await for him to come. And that's the picture that we see here, that we are in the waiting between the promise and the fulfillment. We're in the waiting between what God has said he will do and what is uh, going to happen. So we are still fighting battles. There is a future promise, but we're experiencing current evil. And, and, and this is important for us to, to think through because if there is no future promise, if there is no future fix, if if there is no last day where Jesus comes back and makes the wrong right, then things are just the way they are. 
crime, that's just the way it is. Sickness, that's just the way it is. Natural disasters where innocent people are killed, that's just the way it is. But if we know that Jesus is coming back and he will wipe away every tear, he will fix every wrong, he will punish every sin, he will redeem those who trust in him, we know that the brokenness we see is not the way it's supposed to be. We have, I think, in our hearts an, in, an innate understanding that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. Uh, we sing, we don't sing much, but there's a song quite popular these days um, called Good, Good Father, right? It's who you are. I was going to croon. I know. You probably have never heard it. Um, but, but I've noticed that um, we, some people struggle with that song. Just imagine if you didn't have a good father, right? Imagine if you have an absent father or an angry father or an abusive father or an untrustworthy father. It, it is difficult, right? Father's Day can be hard for a lot of people, for example, because they didn't have a good father. But even knowing that your father is not good is a reminder that you deep down know that there is such a thing as a good father, right? Because if not, you just go, well, that's just a father is what a father, you know, that's just who they are. I think that's the next line of the song. <laughs> right, so, so that would apply to a bad father too if God didn't exist as a perfect father. Because even the best father we know falls short. Well, what do they fall short of? They fall short of the perfect father in God. And so when we think of like, man, that person is not living up to what? They're not living up to this picture of perfection that God is for us. We know that brokenness that we see, that sin we experience, uh, is not the way it's supposed to be. And one of the things we have to do is help people confront that reality. We have to confront that reality. That things are broken, so we have to admit that like, it's not the way it's supposed to be that the system's broken, that our hearts are broken, that our relationships are broken. But then we have to go, and God has promised to fix it if we place our trust in him. So Micah is showing what, he will, what God will ultimately do in the last days. He describes it as the mountain of the Lord. Right? Jerusalem is up on a mountain. Mountains are this picture of power. When you look at a mountain, you're, you're automatically uh, struck by its beauty by its um, size, by its grandeur, right? When you drive past mountains, I, I spent time around lots of mountain ranges. I remember I lived in Denver one summer and you have the Rocky Mountains right behind you and you just look at it and you're just kind of blown away by what's there. The whole thing is just this picture of power. And so he says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. So it's like, not only is this gonna be a mountain, it's gonna be the highest of all mountains. It's going to be exalted. It's going to be lifted up. It says all the people will stream to it. They'll be drawn to it. They'll, they'll gravitate toward it. That these nations are going to come and say, let's go to the mountain of the Lord. So it says the mountain of the Lord, then it says to the temple of the God of Jacob. It's this destination where God is ruling and reigning. So that's what the last days are going to be like. God is going to be king and his rule is going to be over all nations. And so what does it look like, just imagine, for us to really get this sense of what we're calling people toward, what we are living for, what does the rule of God really look like? We see that he, in verse 3, is a just judge, that he judges between these people, he settles disputes, and he doesn't just settle disputes for individuals, he settles disputes for strong nations, right? So think, you know, he's solving the big problem. He's not just dealing with interpersonal conflict, though that exists. You know, like we always joke, like uh, there will never be peace in the Middle East, right? Like that's the classic uh, Miss America. Like, what do you wish for? Like, I want peace in the Middle East. And everyone's like, that's kind of a joke. It's never going to happen. No, that's the kind of thing that he can bring about. That the things that we think are impossible, he can fix. The wars that we think will never end, he can end. So he's a just judge. He brings peace, it says. He says that their sword will be turned into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, that nation will not take up sword against nation, 
They won't train for war anymore. So they will go from using all of the um, all of their wealth to from fighting into growing crops, from destroying people to providing for people. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at the budget of the United States. You guys, y'all don't just, I mean, it's a, we're supposed to, right? Isn't that like our job? I don't know what we do with it. But like, if you look at like a pie chart uh, of our budget, we're essentially like a military with a healthcare system. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, right? Like, because we are so, like, even, even though we don't think of ourselves at war, I think we're in three active conflicts right now. The United States is. I'm not even arguing like whether they're just or not. That's not the point here. What I'm saying is that war is, is, is always present, it seems. The more technology we get, we just update the methods of war, but war is constantly there. Imagine a day when there will be no more war. And everyone is prosperous. Verse 4 says that, that each one of you, to quote the words of Oprah, you get a vine and you get a fig tree and you get a vine, right? We're like, that doesn't make any sense to us. Like, a vine and a fig tree does not sound like prosperity. But th- what the picture there is like shade and protection and provision. I mean, I assume it's kind of like them saying, like, you get a house with a swimming pool and a pergola. Like, I guess, I guess that's kind of what it's going for there. Like, uh, everyone's going to be abundantly provided for. Like, no war... Lots of food, plenty of provision. Because, like, we can kind of fool ourselves into thinking that we're well provided for. But if you look globally, we're in the minority. Like, I don't have the stats off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, we are talking about, like, the 99% versus the 1%. I think there was this whole Occupy movement or whatever. Like, everyone in America is in the 1% globally. Like, I, I, I forget somewhere, like, if you own a pair of shoes... You're like in the top 10% or something like that of like global wealth. Uh, it was something crazy like that. And I was like, oh, wow, that's that. Like my mind kind of hurts just thinking about that. You know what I mean? Um, because we, you know, we think like if I don't have the newest phone or I don't have a, a certain type of car, or I don't have like a mega mansion that I, I'm poor. Um, but, but here he's talking about everyone being provided for. So how does such a thing happen? How does war go away the how does peace come how does provision come the only way to stop war and bring peace is to have a judge wise enough and fair enough to rule correctly but also strong enough to enforce it right the only way that this happens is if that god himself is the perfect judge who can actually enforce what he says and so the picture really if we think about it from kind of a bigger perspective in the bible the picture is of god's heavenly dwelling and his earthly temple coming together. Right? The the mountain of the Lord and the Lord's temple coming together here on the earth. It's it sounds very familiar to the picture in Revelation 21 of a new heaven and a new earth where the holy city, the new Jerusalem, comes from heaven and God establishes his rule from that city on earth. We sometimes, um, for whatever reason, kind of uh, get into this precious moments view of the afterlife where uh, we, we take one verse from Paul to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord and we think like that's all of God's plan you know but God's plan is actually a restoration of paradise right it's it's a picture of creation in the garden um, that's why uh, it says that our ultimate hope is the resurrection of our bodies right our, our um, hope is a very physical hope it is not a disembodied existence playing uh, some harp on a cloud or something like that. It is a very embodied, perfect creation. So one of the best ways to think about the future that God has for us is creation perfected. Like, what would it look like if creation had no sin and functioned exactly the way that God intended it to be? It would be full of beauty and creativity. It would be full of joy and worship. It would be uh, so full of so many things that we miss out. But we see glimpses of it here and there, right? So the image of God is marred but not lost in his creation, in the people that he's created. We see moments when when I listen to good music, I can catch a glimpse of the beauty that God intends for us. When uh, you see like I said, a mountain or a sunset, you see a moment, a glimpse of that beauty, but then we also see brokenness along with that, and we long for that day. So in this vision, we see these nations surrounding the throne of God in worship. 
streaming to God's mountain where he's the present judge and he's teaching. His law is being taught and he's guiding. In Revelation 21, it says that every tear is wiped away. And here it says that everyone is blessed with prosperity and peace and there's no more war. And so why can we trust this? Why can we believe this? It has this little phrase that says, For the Lord Almighty has spoken. We can trust that God has a perfect future because he has said it. And he cannot break his word. And so, so just, uh, there's so much to talk about, about what the last days look like, what the future um, promise God has for his people. But the question I think a lot of us are wondering is like, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean for me today? Right, okay, great. Like, in the end, God's going to fix everything. Awesome. What does that mean for my life today? Here's what it says in verse uh, verse 5. It says, All the peoples walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever. Everyone, all these nations, are walking in the name of their gods, but we are going to walk in the name of the Lord our God. You got to imagine the Israelites here are facing destruction. The northern kingdom has already fallen, the southern kingdom is under attack, they're under siege. And that these Assyrians have all this might. They have this military might. And they think, well, we're strong, we're powerful, so we must be in charge. But their power is their power is temporary. Just think about that. If that doesn't describe our our current situation, I don't know what does. Every, that, that description of everyone does what is right in their own eyes. right? That's the picture of sin in the Bible, that everyone does what they think is right. They follow their gods. If you, if you walk around, everyone is, is following their gods. One of the, the worst, um, one of the most uh, obvious myths is that People who are not religious somehow are not worshipers. Every one of us is a worshiper. Everyone on my block worships something. They worship a, a job, a relationship, a hobby. They worship a religion or a religious figure. They worship a code of conduct. Everyone thinks certain things are right and certain things are wrong. They walk in the name of their gods. They might not call their gods by some ancient foreign god, though some of them do. There are plenty of people who worship false gods that they call names that are re re false religions. But there are plenty more people who worship other idols that they wouldn't think are gods. I mean, the, the most common ones, I think, are, are people worship the idols of power. They worship the idols of success. They worship the idols of money. They worship the idols of experiences. They worship the idols of love or sex. Right? People do this. They worship these things and they walk in that path. And if you try to tell them that they're wrong, they're going to call you a heretic in their own words. Right? It, it, this is not a conversation of like some things are right and some things are wrong and then there's a bunch of stuff in the middle that doesn't matter. People have a code of conduct. People have a morality. And it might change based on our culture, but God's doesn't change. And so everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. I read well, one quote that someone says, the usual life in America leans toward busying yourself with things that seem urgent but aren't. What they were saying is, look, people worship things that bring them temporary pleasure. People worship things that bring them temporary joy. People worship false gods that make them happy for the moment. We are challenged here to walk in the name of our Lord, the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. That means whether we see what we think is success or blessing or prosperity, that we follow God no matter what. I, I was thinking about it this way. I heard, I heard this uh, statement. Sin is fun on credit. It's like, okay, let me think about that. Sin is fun on credit. And what this person was saying this was this. Um, sin is taking a temporary pleasure and ignoring the long-term costs, right? Here we're talking about the last days. Israel is, is losing the battle. Israel is uh, going to be destroyed, and Micah is telling them, look, if you would repent, God has a future for you that is better for, than the moment. 
But most of us think in the moment, right? We, um, we think of what feels good right now. What can I have that will gratify me right now? And so this idea of sin is fun on credit is this. Look, I'm not worried about the future. I'm worried about right this second. Like a person spending money or borrowing money and not paying their bills, going on shopping sprees. One day, the bank's going to find you, right? One day, they're going to repo your car. Um, One day, uh, it's going to catch up to you. And it's going to cost you more than you wanted to pay. Right? We don't need to talk about credit card interest rates, but there's a reason why you can't live off your credit card for long. Because you end up paying way more than something costs. Someone described sin like this. It's like jumping off a tall building. The first 95% of the fall might be fun, but the destination is a problem. Right? And what we're trying to do is think about the future that God has for us. We're trying to help people think about the future that God has for them. And in reality, by understanding the future, we are better equipped to deal with the present. So as followers of God, we have a choice to walk by faith in eternity or faith in what's going to happen in eternity or conform to the patterns of this world. So we can live for a future hope that is sure. So he says, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In contrast to the idolatrous, corrupt people of the surrounding nations, God's people here, according to Micah, should be determined to worship and follow faithfully the covenant Lord, the one true living God, to live a life of faith and faithfulness and obedience and commitment. That's how all God's people should live while awaiting the final, complete fulfillment of the glorious future he promises. When God's irresistible kingdom will be ushered in on this earth by Christ the King and will continue eternally on the new earth. These future events provide an incentive for holy, faithful, fruitful service today. We should live differently because of the reality of the last days, the reality of our future hope, that there is a better day coming. Would you rather have temporary comfort and everlasting sorrow, or temporary sorrow, and everlasting joy. And we say we want everlasting joy, but so often we choose temporary comfort. And so that's what happened to the people of God. So many of of these people are going to be judged and destroyed and taken into exile. And so we hear their their punishment here. And it's not because they were like good people, right? We've heard all about the Israelites. They weren't like, they weren't just being faithful and then look what happens to them. Their leaders were corrupt. The systems were corrupt. They were participating in it. They were bribing. They were oppressing. They were um, participating in the sinful activity. And so they get punished. It says in verse six that in that day, God will gather the lame and those that he, upon whom he has brought grief. He's punished them. They deserved what they got. But if they'll trust in him, he will restore them. It's this picture of their sin driving them away from God. I, th- I think we need to think seriously about how our sin drives us away from God. And we need to talk to people seriously about how their sin drives them away fr- from God. That we need people to understand, we need to understand what it looks like to live in sin, for God to punish us, but for those of us who trust in him to come back to him, that he'll rescue us. That if we admit our sin and put our trust in Jesus, he will rescue us. And I don't know if you feel this way. I don't know if you feel driven away by your sin. I don't know if your bad choices make you feel like you're being uh, punished or sent into exile. I don't know if your fears and your doubts or your lust or your selfishness or your unbelief or your jealousy or your idolatry or your gossip or your anger makes you feel like I'm being punished by God. If you have those, then you are, God will punish you. He will discipline you. But there is hope that when we admit our sin, when we admit our brokenness, when we admit our weakness, God rescues us. He says, 
that he will rescue the lame. He doesn't say he'll rescue the strong. He says he'll actually rescue the weak and make them strong. That the solution is to admit that we are sinners who need to be rescued. And he describes them as sheep. Right? They're sheep who are found by their shepherd king. He will find them. He will protect them. And he will restore them. Our shepherd king will come to find and restore and protect us. And so I'm, I'm left with this question uh, as we enter this last little section. Can you live for Christ as you wait for the day of his final redemption? One preacher puts it this way, a moment after a man dies, he knows exactly how he should have lived. Can you live now how you will have wanted to live, have lived once it's all over? Can you make decisions now based on how you will have want, how you want God to receive you once it's all over? When you're looking back on your life and you go, this is what I wish I would have done, can you make those decisions now? See, what happens oftentimes is we make temporary choices for what feels good in the moment and we forget the long-term plan and promise of God. We live differently in light of the last days. And we also live differently as a redeemed people. So, so he, he's told about this future promise of God, but all of that kind of comes crashing back down to the current reality. You know, snap back to reality. Oh, there it goes. Okay, I'll stop. That, I, was, I was in college a long time ago, guys. That was like, that was cool back then. <clears throat> I didn't say rabbit, though, so we're good. Um, the people are living in punishment now. So it's like you've said all of these things about the last days, and they're like, okay, but, but what about like today, right? It still hurts. It still hurts today. And he, he's saying, yeah, it hurts today. Sin hurts today. They don't have a king. He, he compares their current experience as a nation to a woman in labor, which means he wasn't married because I'm not, definitely wouldn't be brave enough to make that comparison. Um, but that's what their punishment is compared to, that their sin uh, leads to their exile. And But it's only in the punishment, in their exile, that they find rescue. Sin exiles us from God. Look through the Bible. Uh, sin gets, gets us kicked out of the garden. Sin gets us wandering in the wilderness. And here, sin gets us sent into exile. And so this is actually a beautiful picture of salvation because God saves us while we are sinners. He doesn't wait till we get our act together and come saves us. He saves us when we are uh, at our lowest, when we are our worst. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are so many people who think that they have to somehow get it together before they can come to God. As, as a preacher said once that I remember, he said, you don't clean the fish before you catch them. Right? God meets us in our sin. And the people here are sinners. They're idolatrous. They're unbelieving. They've compromised the promises of God for the false promises of their neighbors. But the beauty of the gospel is that God saves sinful people. He finds the broken who admit their sin and he, he rescues them. The worse your sin, the more obvious your need for salvation. The worse your sin, the more powerful your Savior. And so God actually decides to save his people. He's going to punish them for their sin and rescue them if they would trust in him. And he's going to use these wicked nations to do it. So he's going to choose to use the Assyrians, this brutal empire, to show the people their sins so that he can save them. So he sends in uh, the, this uh, Assyrian army uh, to uh, besiege the capital city of Jerusalem. Uh, they are going to eventually, the Babylonians are eventually going to take off uh, these people into exile. And so you can imagine that the Assyrians, these strong, powerful people, and later the Babylonians, these strong, powerful empires, they start thinking that they're something because they're destroying the people of God. They're, they're uh, looting their temple. They're taking away their riches. They're taking away the smart people 
uh, of their uh, society, the intelligentsia, right? They're, they're in charge. We're powerful. And God says, don't get it confused. Just because I use someone to accomplish my purposes, they're not in charge. I'm in charge. He says in verse 12, they don't know the thoughts of the Lord. They don't understand his plan. He's actually gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. There's always more going on than you or I see. Right? I'm reminded of this lately, that when you get to the top of any field of academic study, to the, the tip top, you know a whole, 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 whole lot about a very, 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 very little Right, you, you can know a whole lot about a very little and you're considered an expert. There are experts, there are PhDs in all sorts of fields around the world who couldn't change the oil in their car, right? No human being can, is smart enough or able to, even the smartest possible human being is only going to know a fraction of all knowledge there is. There's always more going on. It kind of reminds me of when we when we do birthday things for our kids. We we plan all sorts of things. We we get cards and presents, and they don't know any of it. Right? They have no idea what's going on. They see a few things here and there. They don't know all that's going on behind the scenes. Then one day, their birthday gets here, and they wake up in the morning, and it's like magic, right? They're like, "Where did all these presents come from?" You know, because when they're asleep, they don't know that like we can still be awake doing things. It's a pretty cool trick. One day it runs out of here. But they wake up and they're like, man, look at all this you've done for our good. That's like God, right? We're like the child. God's like the parent. He's doing so much more than we ever see. And we just wake up and get to enjoy what's happening. So he's taking his people who have now been humbled. And he's actually going to, at the last days, strengthen these humble people. He describes uh, their strengthening like they're, you can tell that they're not women because he calls them an ox, which apparently is like a compliment here. I would not recommend calling a woman an ox. You know, James, in all your pickup lines, let's not do that, okay? But he says their horns are like iron and their hooves are like brass or bronze, I think, right? Like they're, they, they, they're now this really strong thing. So, so from their humility, God actually raises them up. It's actually in our weakness that God can strengthen us. It, it seems like a paradox. It doesn't make sense to the world. This whole thing of the last being first, the first being last, that's the picture that's happening here as well. That the, that the more we recognize our sin, the more God can actually strengthen us. So in the end, God takes these enemies who are used by him to punish his people, and they will be punished for their sin. And God will restore his people. The Assyrians are a picture of sin and judgment because we get judged for our sin. But in our humility, sin doesn't have the final word. God restores, he rescues, he empowers his people to bring him glory. Israel is punished for sin, but the Assyrians who God uses are not in control. The nations are not in control. God is the one who is in control. The people of God are restored so that they can bring honor to God. Look at what it, it says in verse 13. It says, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hoofs bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples and shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. God strengthens his people so that they can devote the spoils to him, that they can glorify him. The people of God are restored so that they can give honor to him. him. Our sin exiles us, but our Savior redeems us so he can get the glory. And we're going to see in the next chapter, next week, an even fuller picture of how he does that when we see a shepherd king born in Bethlehem, hint, hint, who comes to save his people from their sins. We know that our Savior is Jesus, that, this future, that th there's a future for those who have been redeemed by Jesus. And so what does it look like to live as a redeemed people who have admitted our sin, who have been humbled, but have been rescued and restored by God? It means that the promises of God are more real than the problems of the moment. It doesn't make the consequences of our sin personally or corporately or even bigger than that easier 
but it does help us endure them. It humbles us. Listen, our, our salvation humbles us to see the brokenness in our lives and the brokenness in our world and long for the rescue of Jesus. So the question is this. I just want to think about this for a few minutes before we finish. Do we live this way as humble people broken by sin longing for rescue? Are we the kind of people that recognize our sin? Are we the kind of people who live for eternity? It is a weird thing to be around Christians who claim to know everything about Jesus but never admit their sin. Who only justify, who only deflect, who only call out the sin of others, but never say, look, I'm the one who's a sinner. You cannot be a follower of Christ and be prideful. You cannot be living a life devoted to God and think that you have it all together. If you're a follower of Christ, you're humbled. So if you're a follower of Christ, you wait with faithful hope, knowing that God is doing something. And so many people don't see that. Most people think that if our future is going to get better, that we have to work harder or be smarter to do it. Actually, at the funeral of John F. Kennedy, um, President Kennedy, the Senator Edward Kennedy quoted a portion of a previous JFK speech. And he said, he said this, the quoting JFK. Our future may lie beyond our vision, but it is not completely beyond our control. The work of our own hands, matched to reason and principle, will determine our destiny. There is pride in that, even arrogance, but there is also experience and truth. In any event, it is the only way we can live. I would beg to differ. The future is not ours to control. It is actually sinful to claim that we control what must be left in the hands of God. That there is actually another way to live. We can trust in God's sovereign power rather than the work of our own hands. Hope is not secure if it is founded only on human plans and human reason and human experience. Lasting hope is only found in God. So as followers of Jesus, we should be humbly confident. Which, which sounds confusing, right? Like, what's, how is that not arrogance? Humbly confident. We should be humble because we need to be rescued and confident because God has promised to rescue us. One pastor put it this way, don't trust yourself on your best day since you are fallen and don't despair on your worst since you are forgiven. So we walk with trust. Three times in this passage, it uses this language of a parent. It calls um, Zion, daughter Zion. And as a parent, I think about that. I think about what does it look like for a child to trust a parent? And one of the things that Abby's really into right now is me throwing her onto her bed. Like just like picking her up and just like launching her onto her bed, which is not safe. We probably shouldn't do it. Her mom hates it. Right? But I'm her dad, and I'm going to, like, I'm in control. She trusts me. She doesn't even know that this is really dangerous and we shouldn't do this. And so far, she hasn't gotten hurt. If it changes, I'll let you know. But she trusts me. Right? When when Jackson and I walk around the block, I don't know. You guys know where we live. It can get a little chaotic sometimes. But he doesn't even think about it because he's just holding my hand and trusting me. He He doesn't understand everything that's going on. But he trusts me. And I'm a very, very imperfect father. We, on the other hand, can trust a perfect father. We can walk hand in hand. We can trust his plan. We can trust his power. See, Micah knows that everyone can rest secure because eventually God is going to transform this world and set up his kingdom. So in the here and now, we admit our sin and our weakness, that we need God to forgive us and save us. In difficult times, we trust God's plan. And we don't trust the false promises and temporary power of the world. At the end of the day, we build our lives on the only sure and steady foundation, God's plan for us in Jesus. Now, I know most of our stories in here 
some better than others. I know uh, that we, uh, as far as I know, have all made professions of faith. But that doesn't mean that we're walking in trust right now. I'm not so silly as to pretend that just because we have a relationship with God, we are actively walking in trust. You might be harboring sin. Because we're all tempted to it all the time. Temporary pleasure instead of eternal joy. You might be fighting sin. The question tonight is, will you trust God? Will you turn away from the false promises of the world and walk hand in hand with your Father?